from the soon-to-be bugged-out studios of Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA, it is time for another orchestral episode of chemical-free horticultural hijinks, you bet your garden. Yes, the cicadas are coming. I'm your host, Mike McGrath, and on today's show, we'll discuss what the upcoming arrival of the billions of bugs in Brood X means to you. Otherwise, it's a fabulous phone call show. Cats and kittens, that's right. Potential guests are busy purchasing push prunes. So we will take that heap and help it. Of your telecommunicated questions, comments, tips, tricks, suggestions, and ecologically ebullient eccentricities. So keep your eyes and or ears right here, true believers, because it's all coming up faster than you forever associating earplugs with the month of August right after this. Support for You Bet Your Garden is provided by the Espoma Company, offering a complete selection of natural organic plant foods and potting soils. More information about Espoma and the Espoma Natural Gardening Community can be found at ESPOMA.com. Welcome to a thrilling episode of You Bet Your Garden from the studios of Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. I am your host, Mike McGrath. Coming up later in the show, it's a 17-year event, and you won't want to miss it. And you won't if you're in one of the 15 great eastern states that is about to host Brood X, the largest number of periodical cicadas who are going to come out to play and sing to you every night. What could be better? Now, I guess your fabulous phone calls could be better. So let's take one right now. 888-492-9444. Carol, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Hi, how you doing? I am just Ducky, Carol. Thank you for asking. Ducky always uh-huh. likes to get into the show. Um, how, is, how is Carol doing? Oh, I'm doing great, yeah. And where one. is Carol yeah. great? I'm, I'm actually in western North Carolina on the mountains right next to the Smoky Park. Oh, very nice. Beautiful country up there. Oh, yeah, you bet. Oh, oh, although I would always go for the eastern because I am a fool for the ocean. Oh, yeah, I love the ocean, too. Yeah. yeah. All right, what can we do you for? Well, I have this hibiscus tree that we take in and out. It's potted in a ceramic huge ceramic pot it's like 24 inches across mm-hmm. like 22 high but the tree itself is like six foot eight inches it just barely fits in our living room right but um we put it out in the summertime and then we take it in the winter time and um it's it's getting the it's getting the host you did you see the pictures that i sent you no no they don't show me anything here oh. they lock me in a broom oh. closet when we're done it's, taping yeah. oh geez so what it is is I've got these white dots all over my tops of my leaves, and I don't know where they're coming from because the only place I see anything else is right on the new growth, like and especially around the the flower buds. There's these little round kind of oblong bugs that are kind of grayish. Mm-hmm. Okay. And they're, they're really tiny. So this is a tropical hibiscus as opposed to a right hardy hibiscus right and this um you've got it in a ceramic pot is the drainage good yeah it's got a big hole in the bottom and i got a a tray underneath okay don't let water fill in the tray make sure that tray stays dry okay so use a, a turkey baster or something if you water it and there's excess water are you feeding it okay sure well, um, I'm feeding it, um, oh, what is it, Garden Tone. Okay, from Espoma. Organic, from Espoma, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a nice fertilizer. Nothing wrong with that. How often are you using it? Oh, maybe once a month or so. All right, that's perfectly all right as well. Um, it sounds like you possibly have scale, which, which can oh, be a scale. problem. Yes, yeah, scale. Scale are insects okay. that start out just like other insects, but as they mature, they secrete uh, a kind of cement-like substance um, to stick to the plant, 
and then they grow kind of a suit of armor over themselves. Um, so have you tried to simply remove these insects with a damp cloth? Well, what I've done is I, I take the leaf between my fingers and I squeeze it, and okay. you get all this sticky stuff off of them. Okay. Uh, could be aphid. Oh, okay. I'm using um, um, it's a it's a soap safer soap um, spray that has um, neem oil in it. Okay, <clears throat> that's an excellent choice. What's been your experience? Well, it's it just seems like I keep biting it and biting it and biting it. I don't know. Okay. I've so, only been at this, you know, this latest thing about months. Um, one thing about insecticidal soaps is that you realize you have to spray the insect and smother it for the soap to be effective. Right. But what's not often right. spoken of is that you also need another sprayer um, to spray off the soap after a couple of hours. Because if the oh, soap, yeah, oh. if the soap and the neem oil stay on the leaves, they can interfere with photosynthesis and make things tricky. And and don't forget, oh. and, and does this happen outside or only inside? No, it did. I, I, I'm, I can't remember what it was like outside. It didn't seem like it had this many, but I did get these same insects on some Brussels sprouts I grew last year. Oh, well, thank God. The then you didn't have to eat the Brussels plant. sprouts. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I That's love a Brussels sign sprouts. from God. Um, <laughs> yeah. So here's the deal. Obviously, tropical hibiscus is a very delicate plant that really doesn't like to be indoors, although it would die outside. So I would continue treating it with the insecticidal soap plus neem. And then a couple hours later, I would rinse the leaves off really well, which it, this plant is going to love no matter what. Then when it goes out yeah, right. in when it goes out in the summertime, make sure you take a garden hose or a pressurized sprayer and really blast everything off of the tree yeah. before you bring it inside. Give it a good blasting, just sharp, heavy water pressure, not not light, not a little rainstorm. We're talking a laser beam. Let it sit for a day. Move it to a new location, do it again, move it to a new location, ah. do it again for the third day, and hopefully you won't bring anything indoors with it. And the same thing, yeah. if you actually right. like your Brussels sprouts, which means you must have 16 pounds of butter in the fridge, um, you, can spray, <laughs> you can spray these insects off with sharp streams of water. Oh, okay, okay. I'm right. sorry. To me, Brussels sprouts are punishment, you know. I know. I think they're great. So um, so what are those white spots? And I can write. I can well, they write, could I, be. There's nothing. Um, you know, if you're saying they're not they insects. They're not stuck to them. They're no, not they're what? not insects. Okay. Well, insects. Um, it yeah. could be kind of uh, just a weird leaf spot. Uh, depending on the kind of sun exposure the plant is getting indoors. If it's just discoloration... These are, these are, no, it's, it's just particles. It's not anything in, in the leaf or on the leaf. It's just something that looks like it dropped on it, like a piece of... like, like a dust would. And can you, can you wipe it off? Yeah, and I can wipe it, wipe it off. Yeah, just wipe it off. Who cares what it is? Okay, I just wondered where... Well, I was wondering where it came from. There's a ton of it, and it doesn't. It's not proportional to the amount of. Uh, um, there are some plant. There are some plant diseases that manifest in like this. Uh, the different mildews, powdery mildew. Again, this is a very sensitive plant, especially when it comes inside. Um, if you can find something that is more neem oil alone, that would be good for oh. the mildew. Uh, but don't overwater it. Make sure it gets good airflow. Make sure it's not near a hot air vent or anything like that. And it shouldn't be a problem. Okay. Okay. So I just keep doing what I'm doing. So yeah. Add some water afterwards. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Two little bugs, little bugs, little bugs, little bugs, little bugs, little bugs. Two little bugs, little bugs, little bugs, little bugs, little bugs, little bugs. Two little bugs, 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 little bug
888-492-9444. Frank, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Hi, Mike. It's a pleasure to speak with you. It's a pleasure to speak with you, Frank. How are you doing? I'm okay. I'm, I'm in uh, calling from uh, Whitehall, Pennsylvania, but the garden is actually going to be in uh, Nickelville, New York. Where is Nickelville? It's uh, about 30 minutes from the Canadian border. Oh, okay. So it's up there by Ithaca and Syracuse and everything? Yeah, if you ever heard of, I think it's Paul Smith College. No, but um, I barely escaped Temple the University range. alive, so I don't look for those things. Yeah. <laughs> All right, what can we do for you, man? Well, my son-in-law is going to build a raised garden bed. Okay. And I was wondering if you could offer up any uh, tips, tricks, or suggestions on what he what he might have success growing. He's a first timer. Oh well, <clears throat> you know, even though he's up close to Canada they still have a decent summer. So in a raised bed, he can grow, you know, lettuce and carrots and things like that early in the season. Um, And then once the nights are reliably in the 50s, he can install the summer-loving plants like tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, cucumbers. Because it is not the longest season you're going to encounter, he should probably stick with short season varieties. Anytime you buy a seed or a plant, it should have a days to harvest with plants that you grow by seed, like sweet corn and string beans. That's an accurate number once the soil is warm. You know, if it says 60 days, you'll get your first string beans at 60 days. If it is a plant that is typically started uh, professionally or by you and then transplanted outside, that number is the days from the time you put a six to eight week old transplant into warm soil. Uh, One of the keys is to remember not to jump the gun that the nights have to be in the 50s before you put out the crops of summer. But one of the intriguing things about growing um, that far north is he's going to have more hours of daylight than I will down in Pennsylvania. You know, the higher you go, uh, the more extreme the daylight and lack of daylight variations are. So if he, you know, for instance, a lot of people in my region are going to plant around May 15th, provided the snow has finally melted by then. Um, As you get up, as you get up into upper New York State, you know, more likely uh, uh, maybe a beginning day is June 1st. But that still leaves you plenty of time. What he needs to avoid is growing plants like tomatoes that have a very long days to harvest, like in the 90s or even 100. But there's dozens of tomatoes, if not hundreds, that have a days to harvest in the 60s and things like string beans and all that. There's no lack of any plant specifically that he can grow, but he has to pay attention to what we call the DTH, the days to harvest. And where he is, 
the shorter the number, the better the chance of success. Got it. So he wouldn't be growing brandy wines. Exactly right. Um, Got it. You know, it, it's possible with specialized greenhouses or hoop houses, but there are many mid-sized tomatoes that have a more rational days to harvest, like around 70. And, um, you know, maybe you can grow them as brandy wines and ship them. <laughs> Uh, and he'll send you something else. But it, it, it is always good, especially when you're starting out, to be rational about what works in your region. Because you, you can never guess the weather, but you can prepare for it. And if I lived up there, it would be all short season varieties. And many catalogs specialize in early harvest tomatoes. And as times have gone by, I have seen more and more large tomatoes with relatively short days to maturity. So, and, and what you said with brandy wine is so fabulous because I urge people not to fall in love with a specific variety, but instead grow what their climate can help you succeed with. Perfect. Yeah, thanks, Mike. All right, my pleasure. Good luck to you and he. Well, it's time for me to take a little break and remind everybody out there who wants to grow spring peas this season that the clock is ticking on the proper timing for you to get nicely peed in June. But don't go sorting out your snaps and snows just yet because we'll be right back with the upcoming invasion of the 17-year locust and more of your invasive phone calls. I'm Mike McGrath, and you're listening to You Bet Your Garden from the studios of Lehigh Valley Public Media in, where else? Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Support for You Bet Your Garden is provided by the Espoma Company, offering a complete selection of natural organic plant foods and potting soils. More information about Espoma and the Espoma Natural Gardening Community can be found at ESPOMA.com. Welcome back to another thrilling episode of You Bet Your Garden. From the studios of Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA, I am your host, Mike McGrath. And coming up at the end of the show, do we call them Brood X? Do we call them Brood Number 10? Whatever we call these brooding insects, you're going to host billions of them on the East Coast this summer. We'll explain exactly what that means to you and how you're going to clean up all those leftovers after a couple more of your fabulous phone calls at 888-492-9444. Patty, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Thank you. Well, thank you, Patty. How you doing? Uh, I'm good. Better now that I got to speak to you about my chigger issue. Oh, well... We're always better when we're not being um, attacked by chiggers. Uh, where is this chigger attack taking place? Um, it's on my lawn. It's on the side of my house where okay. we first noticed them in between two houses. Right. And, and it, was after, it, it was after a big tree fell and we had the tree removed. That's unusual. And, mm -hmm. and where are you? I'm in um, Jackson, New Jersey. Jackson, New Jersey. Okay. All right. Uh, chiggers, for those who haven't had the joy of experiencing them, I believe they're in the mite family, M-I-T-E. They crawl under our skin, but they don't feed off of us. It's like they just hide under there. And the itching 
is just said to be some of the worst a human can experience. Um, I'm trying to think of who the writer was for the New Yorker. You're being too kind. It is insane. Yes. The yeah. itching. And I didn't even know. I'm from New York City, Manhattan. I didn't know what these things were. <laughs> no, you would not. And I. There was a writer for the New Yorker who uh, got to Paris, which was his dream, and was at the top of the Eiffel Tower and looked out over this amazing landscape. And the only thing that came to mind is, I bet there's no chiggers up here. <laughs> so That is by somebody who's gotten bitten by a chigger. I think he grew up in Chiggerland, <laughs> yeah, uh, which is not Sugarland. And so, anyway, no. <laughs> once you experience the itching, as you know, you'll, you'll never forget it. What you need to do is immediately get into a bathtub uh, with a package of baking soda. And that will relieve oh. the itching. Probably drown the little monsters, too. So that's what you do right away. Um, chiggers are strange in that they exist in what are called little islands. You can be in a big backyard and walk to one spot and be consumed by chiggers or walk to a different spot. That's exactly what happened. And they're, yes, exactly. They live in little islands and they wait for like uh, the, the cast of Gilligan's Island to come stray there and then they infest them on moss. So what we are told about chiggers oh. is to keep your lawn well cut. Don't allow any high areas or areas of brush nearby. Keep it as dry as possible. Chiggers are worst on grass that hasn't been cut recently after a rain. So those are the two things. Make sure there's lots of airflow in the area. So I'm, I'm surprised that they became a problem after the tree came down um, because that should have let more light and air into the area, but you never know with these little creatures. So that's why I'm really curious. The research that I did was saying, keep your lawn cut, and where we found them, when you say an island, that's exactly what happened. My daughter stepped in it, mm -hmm. and on her little Ted sneaker, which was like an off-white brown type, there were hundreds. Oh my God, do they, foot. forget that, they still make so, Keds? Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I took my hand immediately to wipe them off, and they wouldn't move. And thank God, I just took the hose and hosed her foot, and they all came off. That's really good. She got good. one or two bites, and that's the first. Yeah, that was the first experience. We didn't know what they were. I thought they were little ticks. Like um, that's what I thought they were. Well, and there so are. Well, well, wait a minute. There are such things as juvenile ticks that are really small, but they are pretty much solitary hunters. Uh, a chigger attack is like nothing else. There are hundreds of them, if not thousands, jump on you all at once. Now, if you, if you want to never be chiggered again, it would be probably a really good idea, until this goes away, uh, to buy some permethrin-treated clothing. Now, permethrin is a chemical insecticide. Actually, it's a arachnicide. And it hmm. is uh, derived from uh, pyrethrum, from the daisies, um, the original botanical, where you just crushed up the heads of this specific pyrethrum daisy, and they were an insecticide. Permethrin is, has been chemically altered to stay active much longer. And, but you don't put it on your skin, and you don't spray it on the environment. You either use it to treat clothing, like your daughter's kids, or you can buy clothing that has been pre-treated. I can tell you, I have never been bitten by a tick when I am out in my woods wow. wearing my permethrin-treated clothing. Um, you'll find many, wow. many different brands out there, all of which are escaping my, my mental faculties right now. Um, but, you know, look for treated clothing. This is especially, um, a, a, you know, um, hunters and fishers really love uh, permethrin treated clothing because it'll keep um, mosquitoes away from you as well as ticks and chiggers and all those other fascinating creatures of nature. So 
Um, you can go so online. There's not a spray that we could yes. buy and spray yes. the clothing? Yes, you can go okay. to a specialty hunting and fishing store and you look okay. for a permethrin spray that is the concentration is, I believe, one tenth of one percent. So it's very low concentration. Um, and then you take the clothing to be treated outdoors. So you can do sneakers as well as shirts and socks and stuff. And you just spray the clothing until it's saturated. You leave it hanging outside for a while. And then it's good to go through a, a dozen or more washings. So it's not something you have to do okay. all the time. Um, be careful if you're buying it retail or online, the spray, the do-it-yourself spray, because some of them also contain other chemicals. But if it's just permethrin okay. and it's kind of specialized for hunting and fishing, that's exactly what you want. There's really nothing you can do outside other than keep the grass cut short and make sure no water pools up, make sure your drainage is good. Okay, now, can I, I, I have noticed, this was a couple of years ago, the incident with my daughter. That's when we didn't even know what they were. I've since then had people work on my lawn on the other side of my house mm -hmm. um, last, this summer, the COVID summer that passed, mm -hmm. and they also got bit by chiggers. Mm -hmm. And where they worked was out in full sun, mm -hmm. And it's it, there's a lot of trees, and so there's nothing growing high because the leaves are. I let the leaves fall, and I don't rake them up, so the leaves stop them from. And I what I read is they do like to hide under leaves too, or wherever yes. they live is mm -hmm. is by leaves. But the but I keep my grass short, and where my daughter originally got bit is out in full sun now. Yeah, I know. So, it's uh, crazy, but I have been led to believe that these islands can exist anywhere and that they will move around okay. from year to year. So obviously they like something about your neighborhood. Maybe it's a, a good school district for chiggers, something like that. Um, <laughs> and I, I would say yours is a case where permethrin-treated clothing. Um, and finally, I remembered the name of the company that started this. It's called Insect Shield. And they used to provide uh, permethrin-treated clothing to the military when they had to go into tick-infested areas. So Insect Shield is the one online that I've used. And again, there are the do-it-yourself sprays at hunting and fishing stores. And so, so there's nothing I could put on the land, like those, those worms? I ordered those, these microscopic worms. Okay. That's not going to work? Um, I think you probably um, ordered beneficial nematodes. That was a yes. that was a good yes. idea, but I'm not sure they prey on chiggers. So okay. again, treat the clothing. Yeah, from my own research, nothing. They they said sulfur, but there was nothing definitive that if and I sulfur, is, sulfur, which is sulfur is going to change the pH of your soil, which might affect the grass negatively. Okay. Just you know, uh, per me. And now, did you say that they're found in moss? No. Is that what you said? They like moss? No. no. Okay, good. No, must have been some other guy. <laughs> All right, Patty, good Thank luck. Thank you. Bye-bye. 888-492-9444. Mark, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Hi, Mike. Long-time listener, and uh, I have a lawn problem for you. Okay. I live in South Jersey, okay. and I have a backyard that would win awards. For weeds? You get awards for crabgrass, weeds, mm -hmm. and all that other stuff. Right. Uh, I have really, I have, I've been living in this house for 22 years. I have never been able to get a nice, thick lawn. Okay. What I am facing is heavily compacted soil gotcha. that's really thick, heavy-duty clay. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that uh, anything short of technical nuclear explosives would be able to loosen this soil. Well, we actually, but, in the lawn business, do have... The equivalent, which is a core aerator. Now, it's the wrong time of year. Oh, I tried that. You, you have tried core aeration. Yes, I did, and I had the little plugs all over the lawn because I've seen those on the golf course. Right. And, uh, so I rented one a couple of years ago and tried that, and uh, it just laughed at me. I know, and your arms are still shaking, uh, right? Yeah, you got it. <laughs> so here's the thought I had. I have this... Uh, sand pad that we built last year for our grandson's inflatable pool, mm -hmm. about 12 feet in diameter, circle, 
about a foot thick. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering if I could take that sand and spread it out throughout the yard and then rototill it in and try to see if that loosens up the soil and makes it a little more hospitable. Am I uh, barking up the wrong tree? You're barking up maybe three wrong trees. Um, I was afraid of that. Yeah, tilling into the soil uh, releases even more weed seeds than you have now. Plus, sand is kind of a generic term. I researched this years ago, and I'm not sure what kind of sand you used, whether it was play sand or sharp sand, Um, but sand can be very valuable as an element of a potting mixture. Uh, When mixed with clay, especially if it's the really wrong kind of sand, you can actually come up with something very similar to concrete with the, um, you know, with, with, with combining sand and clay might, might be excellent for firing um, dramatic looking pots, but that's not what we would <laughs> use to lighten up soil. Really, the only solution to lightening up soil is removal of, of plugs so the soil can breathe easier. Um, have you tried anything, have you tried a pre-emergent in the spring, like corn gluten meal, uh, to prevent the new run of crabgrass? Yeah, we've tried the, the basic weed and feeds during the winter months and then tried the pre-emergent in the spring. Um, the only thing we haven't tried is that R word that I know you hate. Well, that's not going to work. I suspect and my weeds would just sort of look at that and laugh. Yeah, and, and any kind of food in the winter is a waste of time because the, the grass is dormant. So mm-hmm. what, whatever we're going to do here, how big an area are we talking about? Oh, maybe 60 feet by 100 feet. So it's not that, um, not that difficult. So what I would do is live with what you have right now. And then instead of, um, in, instead of the core aeration, because that was uh, obviously not enough, yes, you may rent a tiller or, you know, however you want to do it and till up that soil repeatedly beginning in early August, say August 1st, and till it up once a week. Now, you're going to release a lot of essential nutrients uh, from the soil. But you're also going to break up the clay and uh, make it difficult for the weeds to survive. If you're willing to, and I know, you know, uh, when you have a lot of something, you want to use it. But I I would give it to somebody who needs to make a child sandbox instead and invest in a whole bunch of perlite which you get in giant bags. It's that white popped mineral, uh, volcanic mineral, Mm -hmm. really lightens soil very well. I would also till in a fair amount of compost. Then when we get to around August 15th, you want to stop tilling and you want to rake away as much of the debris as you can. Now, you're never going to get it all, but get as much of the greenery out of there as you can and feel free to compost it. Then level the soil, spread the right kind of seed for your environment, what, you know, shade, sun, whatever, but make sure you buy Mm -hmm. a branded seed. It won't just say something like fescue. It'll say like double down rebel fescue number six, something like that on the bag. Uh, Because if you do use fescue, you have to overseed every couple of falls, and it's always good to have matching seed information. Put down the new seed, cover that with about, um, you know, half an inch to an inch of really lightweight topsoil or even more ideally um, a ton of bagged organic potting soil. And then water that day and night. Water it 20 minutes in the evening, 20 minutes in the morning. At that time of year, with the soil still warm, but the nights getting cooler, that's the ideal time to start a cool season lawn in New Jersey. So it'll be up in like five to seven days, then stop that watering, and any time you go a week without rain, put down an inch of water, um, especially while it's still forming. This lawn will be its happiest in the fall going into the winter, 
and then it'll be happy again coming into springtime. And in springtime, you definitely want to feed it corn gluten meal when the local forsythia are in bloom to take care of any uh, dormant weed seeds that you left uncovered, especially from the crabgrass. Then you'll start out with a lawn that you got no excuses about. That works, and I think I've already got another use for the sand. The uh, neighbors on both sides have little kids, and they've already got their sandboxes. But uh, excellent, I've got a gravel patio that needs to be leveled, and I think I can just rake the gravel back, shovel that sand into it. That sounds good. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. Well, it's time for me to take a little break and remind everyone who hopes to grow spring peas this season that you need a well-timed plan to be able to be a happy pea picker in June. But don't go searching for all the details in our very recent pea picking question of the week, because we'll be right back with warnings about Brood X and more of your brooding phone calls. I'm Mike McGrath, and you're listening to You Bet Your Garden from the studios of Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. Support for You Bet Your Garden is provided by the Espoma Company, offering a complete selection of natural organic plant foods and potting soils. More information about Espoma and the Espoma Natural Gardening Community can be found at ESPOMA.com. Welcome back to another thrilling episode of You Bet Your Garden from the studios of Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. I am your host, Mike McGrath, and we're in the stretch now. Cats and kittens, whether you call them brood X for the Roman numeral or brood number 10 for what that numeral stands for, they are coming to 15 states and Washington, D.C., and there's going to be billions of them. Where are we going to put them up? We'll answer all your questions, or at least a few of them, about the upcoming periodical cicada invasion after a couple more of your fabulous phone calls. All right, that number to call, our brand new number, and we are paying the bill for this one, so it should work for a while. 888-492-9444. Philip, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for being had, Phil. How are you doing? <laughs> We're doing just fine here. Um, I have a two-part question for you today. Okay, I probably um, have first. at least one part question for you first. Where are oh, you? I know you're going to have lots of answers. <laughs> yeah. I'm in Maple Glen, Pennsylvania. Maple Glen, where's that? Um, it's about half an hour south of Doylestown. Okay, gotcha. All right, what's up? Okay. Okay, about a month ago, I pre-purchased a cauliflower plant from a home shopping show. They promised it would be easy to grow, and I have lots of delicious homegrown organic cauliflower for my family this summer. But I did some research after I purchased it, and I'm reading that cauliflower attracts aphids. And I've never had aphids on any of my produce plants before, just on my roses. I don't want to attract aphids or have to fight them off for my food. Does cauliflower really attract aphids? No. Now, what did did this shopping network send you physically? Little baby plants? They haven't sent it yet. Oh, they haven't sent it yet. They said they're going to send, no, it's a pre-order that Mm -hmm. they send when it's the appropriate time in my area for planting. And uh, they said they send three plants. And it's a special variety that grows really easily in in a pot and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um. No, cauliflower is not known as an aphid attractor. You named the number oh, okay. one aphid plant already when you said roses. Right. They love, even in a, a nicely kept organic garden, those aphids, they love to go for the roses. And I'm hoping you've heard my advice over the years to spray them off the plants with sharp streams of water. It has, been, it has been proven to be the most effective aphid attack method out there. Yes. Uh, I'll be really yes, curious, as, you know, because uh, generally cauliflower, <clears throat> I'm curious as to what kind of plants you're going to get. Um, but make sure, depending on how late in the season they get there, um, that they have a planting location that would not be full sun all day because they could bolt okay. in the worst of the summer heat. Or you can okay. just let them grow to a nice size. All of these things taste great when they're smaller. And um, harvest them by cutting them off at the stalk 
And um, I know broccoli will, but I think cauliflower will also regrow from a cut stalk. And then you'd have... Yeah, they claim it will regrow. Yeah, and then you'd have a, a great crop in the fall when the weather is getting constantly cooler. Right, right. Okay, that's good to know. And then my second question, because then I started thinking about it, how I watch you faithfully every Saturday, is I should be proactive about this and just ask Mike, <laughs> what, plants, <laughs> what plants are the best to grow? And we always get the disease and pest-resistant varieties, but which are going to be the easiest to grow to get a good crop without having to have to fight varmints all summer long? Oh, man, there's no mammal-resistant plants. Uh, that's all physical. No, we, uh, I, Go ahead. Yeah, we, we grow them on our deck, so we're all protected from that. Mm -hmm. It's just the flying critters. Well, what are you growing? Well, we grow zucchini and cucumbers and garlic and stuff like that, but I, I think the, the cauliflower aphid scare kind of had me mm -hmm. worried that if I start growing more things like beans and peas and... I, I refuse to try tomatoes because I hear of all the problems tomatoes have. Oh, I, I just want a nice, I coward. want a nice easy summer. Coward! <laughs> I am a coward. You can't, you can't call yourself a gardener until you grow tomatoes. Come on, that's the. Uh, but I'm not frustrated. Oh God, that's the gateway drug to all of gardening. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I've never seen a pest harm garlic. If the if the soil right. gets too soaked, it can get neck rot. Um, right. But with the other ones, there are some pests that go after cucumbers and stuff. And my advice would be not to anticipate, but to be ready. Just have a pressurized okay. sprayer. You can get them that are just a quart or a gallon and pump it up. And as soon as you see the first bugs, just blast them off uh, with sharp streams of water. I know it sounds okay. almost too simple. Um, but in all my training, I keep hearing over and over again that water is the best pesticide. Yes, you've taught us that. Yes. So go in there without fear. Make sure the um, planting media is correct, you know, like half potting soil, half yes. compost, um, a good yes. amount of perlite. And um, don't look for trouble. Trouble will find you. You know this. I do know that. I was just hoping there was a way to prevent it, but I guess it's... There's nothing. Well, that's not true. You a grow positive attitude. You grow healthy plants in yes. the correct kind of environment. And you said you're growing disease resistant plants, which will help with the cucumbers. Um, I don't think you got much to worry about because you sound like you know what you're doing. And the key to any organic operation, whether it's a farm or a garden, is you gotta walk it every day. You have to go out and look right. at your plants in the morning, in the afternoon, and see if anything's happening so you can nip it in the bud. Oh, 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 that was yeah, a pun. That was a pun. Ho, 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 I'm so clever. <laughs> All right, man. I think, I think you're going to do right. fine. Thank you very much. You take care. Bye-bye. Well, it continues to be inevitable. It is time for the question of the week, which we're calling Attack of the 17-year cicadas. Britt writes, I'm feeling ducky in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and have been hearing a lot about cicadas lately. Apparently, we're in for a giant emergence of periodical cicadas this summer. As far as I know, I've never been near a cicada emergence, but it sounds like this is a good time to invest in earplugs and noise-canceling headphones. From what I've learned, they shouldn't be a problem for my plants because they don't seem to eat after the adults emerge. But is there any benefit to having piles of dead cicadas around? Can they be pitched into the compost bin? I know, like you always say, having a lot of something doesn't mean you should use it. But they're going to lay around and decompose into the landscape anyway. It'd be great if I could at least clean up driveways and sidewalks after they're deceased. Otherwise, I'm just looking forward to checking them out. I have four adventurous nieces, ages eight and under, and can't wait to send them pictures and videos. But I'll probably be less excited after a couple of days of listening to bugs screaming. Well, you win a prize for that last light. 
as cicadas are in the family of true bugs, as opposed to other families like flies, beetles, ants, lepidoptera, etc. They are loud, but some people find it a soothing background noise, like crickets on a warm summer evening. Many other people do not. Anyway, there are two types, annual and periodical. Annual cicadas show up in small numbers every summer, but the periodicals are the real stars of the cicada stage. And you are correct that 2021 is almost certainly going to be a banner year for bugheads, as we will be hosting Brood X, the most famous of these heavily researched groups. Back in 2004, this brood emerged in huge numbers from the soil, climbed up onto trees, shrubs, and walls, and shed their exoskeletons, bursting out with big red beady eyes, candy apple green and dark black bodies, and translucent wings. Then they made their mating call, which is different from that of the annual cicada, so nobody gets mixed up. Anyway, they mated. The females climbed up on trees and shrubs, made little slits in the branches, laid their eggs therein, and then promptly died. Once the eggs hatched, the larvae dropped to the ground and hastily burrowed down deep to slowly suck on plant roots. That was 17 years ago. And instead of getting ready for college, these offspring are just now getting ready to be adults, eh, at least for a couple of days. They are not considered to be a danger of plants. The insertion of the eggs generally does no harm, and the babies deep underground feed very slowly. <laughs> After all, they got a lot of time to kill. Brood X or 10, no one knows for sure, is known as the Great Eastern Brood and is scheduled to appear in 15 states, including Michigan and Washington, D.C. Brood X was first described in 1715 by the pastor of what we call the Old Swedes Church in Philadelphia. Later, the famed botanist John Bartram, also a Philly legend, figured out the emergence times of the brood and their method of egg laying. His son, Moses Bartram, followed with details of the larva hatching and, quote, burrowing into the first opening they can find. This year's emergence is expected to be in the billions of bugs, and that is exactly how they survive as a species. There are just more of them around at any one time than any bird or other insect eater can handle. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of fat and happy birds at the end of this summer. One of the things I find most interesting about these creatures is the fact that they leave behind two bodies. The exoskeleton, which is glued to a wall or a tree, and the adult body, which when they number in the thousands can make for a really crunchy driveway when they're all done. Kids are always spooked when a big adult buzzes into them. They are plant hoppers and not especially good flyers. But I always found the alien-like exoskeletons to be especially creepy. Their bodies are nitrogen-rich and do a good job of feeding the soil after they expire. So one method of cleanup would be to just sweep or leaf blow the carcasses around the base of trees and shrubs or spread them out over an asparagus patch if you got one. They would make an excellent addition to a compost pile, as long as it contains lots of shredded leaves to balance out the nitrogen. Oh, and if you're adventurous, it is said that they taste like asparagus. I would be remiss if I did not now mention the famous cicada-killing wasp. Although fairly large for a wasp, the female must attack and sting an adult cicada many times her size and then get it over to the nest hole she has prepared in your lawn. If it lands on the ground, 
she drags it over. If it gets caught up in a tree, she has to try and fly it back down. Notice that she does not so much fly as plummet. Then she drags it to the hole, drops her eggs on top, and fills in the hole, allowing her developing larvae to consume the large bug over time. What a charming bedtime tale for the kitties. Well, that sure was some interesting information about the upcoming invasion of Brood X or Brood Number 10 or whatever. Now, wasn't it? Luckily for you, the question of the week appears in print at the Gardens Alive website to read it over at your leisure or your leisure. Just click the link for the question of the week at our website, which is still and will forever be youbetyourgarden.org. Gardens Alive supports the You Bet Your Garden question of the week, and you will always find the latest question of the week at the Gardens Alive website, whether we have a phone number or not. Yikes, my producer is threatening to send me his cicadas if I don't get out of this studio. We must be out of time. But you can contact us anytime. Just send us your email. You're tired, you're poor, you're wretched refuse, teeming towards our garden shore at ybyg at wlvt.org. Please include your location. You'll find all of this contact information and updates on our allegedly new phone number at our website, youbetyourgarden.org, where you'll also find the answers to all of your garden questions, audio of this show, video of this show, audio and video of old shows, I, plus our internationally renowned podcast. You Bet Your Garden is a half-hour public television show, an hour-long public radio show and podcast, all produced and delivered to you weekly by Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. Our radio show is distributed by PRX, the Public Radio Exchange. You Bet Your Garden was created by Mike McGrath. Mike McGrath was created when Henry Pym, the original Ant-Man, tried to steal his brainwaves so he could use them to program the ultimate evil artificial intelligence machine. Uh, but it turns out that there weren't any actual waves to steal. Ken Queter plays our theme music. Our chief content officer is Yoni Greenbaum. Our angel of the airways is Christine Dempsey. Our sound engineer is cheerful Charlie Sarah. Our social media director is Amanda Norfleet. Check out her fine work at the You Bet Your Garden Facebook page. Tavia Minnick is our princess of profound production. The always lovely Jonas Bowen is our audio editor. Judicious Jake Boyer does the video. Our directorial director of direction is the harassed and harried Javier Diaz. Andy Cummins continues to take our temperature at the door. Formerly featured in a very brief role in Superman vs. the Mole Men, Zach the Tack Wisniewski survived the heat vision he should have thought about beforehand to stagger badly singed once again into the house. Ably assisted by the usual gang of idiots, including Eric Werner, Jacob Morris, Jeff Frederick, and many more too expensive to mention. Contrary to recent reports in the media, our beloved CEO Tim Fallon apparently has been seen recently uh, but only on the sides of milk cartons. I'm your host, Mike McGrath, busily planting several types of spring peas, raising tomato starts, and just plain keeping busy until I can see you again next week. It's the only vegetable we eat like a fruit, and it's one of the few true perennial vegetables. I'm Mike McGrath, and on the next You Bet Your Garden, we'll discuss how to grow your own rhubarb, plus your fabulous phone calls. That's on the next You Bet Your Garden.